the use cases for generative AI are kind of like a mirror. Like if you know yourself really well, you have that self-awareness as an organization, then you can really help understand what can be solved with regards to generative AI or really any innovation. Welcome to the Talking AI Podcast, where we talk AI with both experts in the field and early adopters. I'm your host, Matt Page, and we're here to demystify AI for you so you can get some value from it. Let's talk some AI. We talk to experts in AI and early adopters on the Talking AI podcast, and today's guest fits both those criteria, so we're, it's going to be fun. We're, you're in for a treat today. But today we're joined by Matt Lewis, founder and global chief AI officer at Inizio Medical, and Inizio Medical's focus is in the life sciences a life sciences industry, including pharmaceutical, biotech, medical device, neurotech, visual therapeutics, all kinds of really interesting stuff. And they're huge. They have 15,000 people, 41 offices worldwide. And they're the commercialization partner to a lot of the big names out there in the space. But welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks, Matt. I'm so happy to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, excited to dig into this and how Gen AI is impacting the life sciences space. And like with any industry right now, the, the promise is Gen AI is going to completely revolutionize it in the life sciences space and healthcare is no exception. However, in this industry, the risk of being wrong is elevated in a major way because there's real consequences. And that's exactly what we're going to get into today in the episode, along with the challenges, the breakthroughs, and really all the interesting stuff Matt and his team have learned thus far in their adoption of AI in the life sciences space. But Matt, give, give us a bit of context before we jump into it of your team's makeup and background and kind of your role as chief AI officer to set us up. Sure, sure. Happy to do it. And again, uh, thanks to the audience. Thanks for taking time with us today. It's uh, you know, a real passion of mine to try to use augmented intelligence to really speed time to decision. Life sciences is one of those things that you know everyone touches one way or another. And if we can find a way to improve people's health, through AI, you know, it's uh, so much better for all of us, for, you know, for our friends, our family, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks for giving me the time and the, and the floor for a little bit. Uh, just a, a point of clarification, though, I, I did found the AI augmented intelligence practice here at Onesio Medical. And before that, the Medical Analytics and Innovation Group, which is our kind of medical affairs advanced analytics practice uh, across the group. I am not a founder of Onesio Medical itself. I wish I was. Um, it was uh, it would be a, a great uh, a benefit if I, if I was a you know primary equity holder of the company, but uh, so much not the yeah. case. I'm just an employee like many folks. But um, good clarification there. But like initiating these AI uh, practices and spaces within the company that's that's sure. not a small undertaking, not a big deal. So we're not going to shortchange you there. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, how maybe how I got here if if, if that's helpful. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit about um, how you got here. I think, too, like your team's makeup, like what is your sure. team composed of in this, uh, you know, role as chief AI officer? Who, who's, who are you working with in that regard? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the, the chief AI officer role is uh, it's a new kind of new-ish position, if you will. I've been in role for just about a year and a half now or so. Um, it was appointed late spring 23. So um, you know, so I have a, a chance to get my feet wet and kind of figure out what it is the organization wants me to, to really be doing. But um, there is an internal expectation to help transform the Inizio ecosystem across the way we work and kind of how we work smarter, as it were. Um, and then there's an external disposition as well to help our clients and our partners and patients and clinicians and payers and regulators do smarter things. Um, so internally, like that's all about like thinking about kind of juxtaposing generative AI on top of our operations so that we can be more efficient and productive and make smarter decisions. But externally, there's also a consideration of kind of what does good look like and how do we do that in responsible and ethical and compliant ways so that we can speed time to content and so that people that are really uh, challenged with different health decisions can optimize their 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 situation and kind of really improve outcomes. So I, I have both kind of responsibilities and depending upon kind of what time of day it is and what day of the week it is and which country I'm in, it's a, a, a different work stream typically that I'm engaged with. So for example, it could be that, you know, part of our responsibility is working with, uh, you know, our learning and development colleagues. I have a, a colleague who leads the learning and development sleeve within Indizio Medical. She's based in the UK. And um, so, you know, we have a curriculum across our 2,500 plus staff internally to upskill or kind of augment the capabilities and competencies of our staff. We're mostly PhD, MD, PharmD staff, if you will, mm -hmm. very technical, deeply, you know, intelligent folks. 
but you know, learning from a digital skills perspective, how to use AI to you know, write uh, different types of content or work with experts in ways that you know maybe haven't always been the the kind of the focus, if you will. So that that's one kind of aspect of the work. Um, another aspect I work with our chief transformation officer uh, was his name is Rich Rich Lawrence um, to uh, kind of think about standing up pilots and experiments across our organization where we can solve for some of the key strategic challenges across the organization and thinking how we uh, kind of optimize for that, uh, th- those those issues that we can solve internally and figure out what needs to scale, what we can deprecate, how we can advance, you know, really that learning internally before we kind of take a take on a bigger kind of chunk, if you will. And we have hundreds of pilots that we're kind of exploring at any given time. All right. So I got several rabbit holes <laughs> kind of want to go down now, but there's two things that I, I was picking up there. And we see this a lot with you know folks we're talking to and just seeing in the market and all kinds of reports that are out there. But there's this concept of, you know, how do I apply it internally to my operations and how I operate my business? And then how do I integrate it into the services, the products and the things I'm offering? There obviously is a kind of a risk factor that comes into play. And then you also mentioned that you have all these different pilots going on. Mm-hmm. What, what does that process look like to identifying what, what are we actually going to pilot? What, what does that look like for y'all in your organization? How are you prioritizing those? Because I think it's super interesting for folks because a lot of people are sitting there at this huge Excel sheet of all these use cases and things. Sure. So it's like, well, where do I even start? Yeah, I mean, we, we do this work internally. We've been doing it for years, years and years and years. Mm-hmm. And we also do it on behalf of and with our, our direct clients. So, you know, I was with a, an organization this morning. Uh, well, it was their afternoon, but it was my morning. And yeah. they want us to, to do this exact type of implementation across their commercial ecosystem. And, you know, they're, they were discussing with me, like, you know, what should the use cases be? Should they be things that come, like, right out of the McKinsey white paper? Should they be things that, you know, our leadership is telling us are important? Should they be things, Matt, that you've heard, you know, out in the world that, you know, you think are resonant? And I, I said to them the same thing I'll say to you, which is that you know the, the use cases that an organization needs to satisfy are really unique to that organization. There there isn't like a magic mm-hmm. list of use cases that that works for everyone. It's really like the use cases for generative AI are kind of like a mirror. You know, like if you know yourself really well, yeah. if you have that self awareness as an organization, then you can really help understand what can be solved with regards to generative AI or really any innovation because. Like for an organization, for example, that has just come out of a major restructure and, you know, has shifted the boxes on the org chart and there are costs to be kind of extracted, if you will. The things that they need to solve for with regards to, you know, their strategy, implementation, pilots and the rest are going to be very different than an organization that is in late phase two in clinical trials for a new drug Mm -hmm. has not gone through a restructure and is looking at kind of speeding time to market. Very similar kind of entities on the stock market, if you will, but very different internally. One is really focused on, you know, efficiencies and gains and you know, how do you think about, you know, kind of optimizing for headcount and, you know, helping with productivity. The others much more focused on content and omni-channel and those types of considerations. So, you know, I can't, you know, kind of as a an external kind of officer come in and say, these are your priorities. Only the, the leadership knows that. But, you know, when you complement that with a, an understanding of what AI can and can't do together, it's magic. Is there any type of, uh, you know, matrix or assessment you take folks through? Like, obviously, they're the expert. You kind of want to extract it out of them. Is there anything you're looking at in terms of whether it's the value, the risk? Are there other attributes and parameters you're looking at at the use case level as you're trying to figure out how we prioritize uh, one use case over another? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there definitely are a number of um, kind of frameworks and, uh, you know, kind of different models or kind of mental models, ways of looking at Mm -hmm. um, assessing use cases and thinking about like what's really kind of paramount for an organization. All the big firms, uh, the BCG, McKinsey, all have uh, one version or another of these types of frameworks and they all use different words, but they all essentially say the same thing using different words. Uh, I, I believe the the McKinsey model is one where they suggest that firms that have a kind of an opportunistic kind of consideration about what needs to be solved, that they kind of approach that from what they call like a taker mindset. Like you know, they need to kind of take the mm. available like licenses or 
software considerations right off the shelf. Like, you know, Microsoft Copilot is a great example. It's right there for the taking. Just get a license. And now all of a sudden people can use Gen AI directly without having to learn how to code. They don't have to use any models or algorithms. They just, you know, use it directly. And all of a sudden AI is working in their organization. That's like the easiest way to kind of parse Gen AI. The next stage is what they call shaping or shapers. Mm -hmm. They're working with firms that are out in the ecosystem like ours and others to collaborate on platforms or models they built. And those platforms have some maybe uh, configurations, if you will. They're not highly customizable, but they can be adapted a bit to use. And that's a more advanced consideration than just kind of buying a license off the street. And then the, the biggest thing that people are doing, not a lot of people, but some people are doing, like, you know, the Bloombergs of the world, JP Morgan Chases of the world, um, Verizon and other companies like that maybe are like, you know, what they call a maker. Like, so, you know, they're, they're mm. building their own models and they're from scratch, like designing things that are just for their, their own environment. Um, I think BCG calls the same types of things that McKinsey calls take your shape or maker. They call them deploy, shape and uh, reshape and invent. But it's the same yeah. consideration that like, if there are things you can do cheaply, get experience understand what works for you and what, what doesn't. If there are things that you can partner on or you know buy that add value in the short term, you should definitely consider doing that because there's no substitute for experience. But some organizations are going to spend a lot of money to build something that's unique to them that they really own as their own IP. It's not common, but it, it does happen. Mm -hmm. And you know there, there are some groups that think that that's, that's important. That's a good breakdown. So back to your point earlier, looking in the mirror, you kind of have to know where you are um, in the marketplace, what type of organization are you and where you're trying to, to play in essence there. And you've had, you know, a couple of years or so to play around with gen AI, uh, tools as they've been coming out and proof of concepting and whatnot, but in this life sciences space and category that you live in, what are some of the interesting use cases or problems you've seen arise that gen AI is uniquely suited to solve? Any that come top of mind, whether they're internally faced, facing or if they're, you know, kind of external solutions that are emerging. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a bunch. And I'll, I'll share two that I think are probably resonant for uh, kind of our world, if you will, because, um, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges um, in the space that we're in to get, um, you know, relevant, contextual, deep subject matter expert content to the audiences mm -hmm. that, that matter, if you will. The two biggest ones I think that people talk about uh, a lot are what's called like a patient or a provider or pa or kind of lay person summary, essentially, which is like a, a quick kind of overview of a clinical trial that is provided to a lay audience. Um, in the European mm -hmm. Union, this is a regulatory requirement. When you finish a, tr a study, you have to publish this type of thing. In the U.S., it's not a requirement, but some companies still do it. Um, so, you know, if you're a patient, and you're on a particular drug, uh, it's it's kind of the only thing you have that says this is what the drug has been studied to do and what the objectives were, the endpoints, what the results were and what, what you should kind of consider for it. But because there are so many things that go on to get out of the trial and into the market, it's often one of the last things that gets done. So to get from mm -hmm. kind of the backlog of the study completion into the actual environment it takes a lot of you know in-depth technical writing, a lot of review, a lot of editing, a lot of annotation, a lot of approval. So generative AI can kind of speed time to completion by helping to summarize, helping to edit, helping to help kind of pro provide an early draft potentially for a, a subject matter team, people that understand what patients' lived experience is like to stand up a, a, a really kind of working version that instead of taking you know 30 days to complete 30 business days or you know essentially like two and a half sorry, but one and a half months, you can do the whole thing in less than a week. So you can get wow. potentially a, a much shorter time to delivery and the quality doesn't suffer. So if you're in the UK and you need like maybe a sixth grade reading, reading level or such, um, you can still produce that in a much shorter time and you know have a, a quality that people can respond to and hopefully make decisions. So that, that's a, a good thing. I when, when My apologies. I was I was going to say that when, when people first started doing this though, I think it, they they said, okay, we, why don't I just use like you know ChatGPT and I can just you know go yeah. to ChatGPT and, and build this direct? And I think that's a it's a great question and it comes up all the time. I encourage people to do that. Go into ChatGPT or you know Gemini or Anthropic or you know whatever people use and try to solve your problems locally. Because when you get to a point with Gen AI on your own, 
and you get that like frustration where it doesn't do exactly what you want it to, then you kind of realize kind of what the limits are of the technology. There are things mm. that certainly can be done off the shelf, but most of the really kind of purpose built applications that people really need solved in the enterprise are not commercially available through consumer applications like ChatGPT or Gemini. So you really do need more of a specific implementation like the ones that are being built by firms like ours. So it, it's it's helpful to build that experience. You can kind of understand what the limits are, how to prompt, what a temperature is and and all the rest. But you get to a point where you're like, hmm, this isn't exactly what I needed. And to get what I can actually share with patients or with the regulatory authorities, I need a, a partner, if you will. So, so two things for the audience there that I thought were really insightful is a lot of times folks feel like there's this barrier where they're not equipped to go and start playing around with these tools. And like for me and you, Matt, we're, we're living it every day. So we're kind of used to it. And we have this artificial view of, oh, everybody's using this stuff, but they're not. So I think that's a great point. Just start using the stuff off the shelf or just every everyday use cases, tasks, workflows, things like that. Because to your point, then you figure out where's your, your breaking point. And then, okay, now you can go deeper and figure that out. The other thing that was interesting, there's this component of personalization that uh, personalization that's really unique, I think, with this type of technology. Because you mentioned something about like different grade reading levels uh, and being able to tailor the response for the individual. I think that becomes a really unique component. When you're thinking about Gen AI solutions, it's so much easier now to actually tailor something to a user than what it used to be uh, in the past. You, you don't yeah. need this huge kind of if then crazy tree of scenarios and things that may happen. You're kind of just plugging in the large language model there in a sense. And I, I, so I do want to get into more use cases, but you hit on something like a type of solution when you get to this breaking point. Mm -hmm. And we've discussed a bit in the past RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Yep. I think y'all are playing around with some of this, but I, I'd love for you to go a bit deeper into how you're using that. And then if there's other uh, examples of uh, using the technology outside of RAG uh, that, that you're experimenting with as well. Yeah, I mean, I think anyone that's building in the space right now is using RAG. I mean, it's it's kind mm -hmm. of like the de facto kind of uh, Band-Aid, really. It's it's not it's not yeah. really a solution. You know, it's it's like a temporary fix until the the space evolves to a point where people can really build their own custom models with their own data in a secure and compliant mm -hmm. fashion, and, and and it's you know a little bit more kind of approachable than than it is at present. But you know, it's a, a lot better than with the way things were eighteen months ago for sure. And I'm sure you've seen, I've seen a lot of the early, you know, readouts from like Stanford and MIT and the Cornell and other places where they're suggesting what the next version of, of that is going to look like, where it's, it's a lot more, uh, you know, holistic and a lot more approachable. And you know, what mm -hmm. 2025 is going to look like will be really interesting and exciting. Um, I mean, in addition to RAG, the other big problem is, is that, you know, a lot of the platforms that people are building are not um, harmonized to a given uh platform or model. So like, you know, mm -hmm. one platform might be built with Llama, another platform might be built with OpenAI, another platform might be built with Gemini. So if you learn how to prompt as a as a user in one model, you only learn how to prompt in that model. It's not really transferable to another platform, which mm -hmm. in large enterprise gets really confusing because if you're like a real person, a human, a real actual human being, and you have a real job and your job is like medical writer or you're a strategist or you're a client services person and AI is like 4% of your job and you just got trained to do prompt engineering in GPT-40 and now you get thrown a Gemini build platform that is completely different, doesn't respond the same way. You just don't have the time to like upskill in that mm -hmm. platform on top of all the other stuff that you have in your day job. So it's like there this lack of harmonization and prompting between the platforms is like a technical problem that the AI engineers know they need to solve. But in the real world, it creates real challenges for actual people trying to do work. I think eventually this discrepancy will go away and that prompting will be less relevant than it is now. Mm -hmm. The same thing with RAG will be less relevant than it is now. And you know it, uh, what will replace it will make it a lot easier to build. Like You'll see things more like what Anthropic is doing and what the GPTs are within OpenAI and the rest, where you won't need as much technical know-how and be more subject matter expertise that's, that wins the day. Um, but for now, it is the the cornerstone of most of what what was being built in in couplet with D 
deep subject matter expertise in the spaces that you're building. You can't really build anything if you don't know the space well. I mean, just like you can't you really get a, a response or a decision out of a model if you if, with prompting if you don't know humans well, if you don't know what yeah. people how people live and how what frustrations and friction they have in their lives. You can't just show up at ChatGPT, as you know, and ask it for the answer. It doesn't even know what questions to ask if you don't tell it. So you have to have a, a sense of the world, so to speak, or you, you don't get anything valuable back. Yeah, and I've, it's interesting you called it a Band-Aid. I'm trying to figure out a time in you know, some previous era where there was something similar that happened, maybe in the you know dot-com explosion or things like that, because it's an interesting perspective because it is something that kind of gets you there. But solutions will probably evolve over time where we may look back on RAG and think, oh, you know, <laughs> that, that simplified approach we were using back in the day. But before yeah. the audience, just uh, like to hit on what what RAG is. So and I'll I'll speak to it and you correct me where I'm wrong. But effectively, you're connecting an LLM to your own documents and data, databases, resources, all kinds of data sources. You're uh, using an embedding uh, model to vectorize that data into a database so the LLM can effectively query your own data versus the entirety of the internet and you get some general response. Because what what large language models are not trained on is your own proprietary data. So it kind of gives you that ability to hook an LLM into your data and you can tailor it in a much deeper way. You mentioned temperature and some other things like that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's w one of the ways, RAG is one of the ways in which you can you know, lower the likelihood of responses coming that are not helpful for the intended outcome. Yeah. You know, I, I said, note the words that I say. I'm not saying that you get responses that are inaccurate or false or mm -hmm. lies, as people say. And I, I'm not a believer in that approach. I think, you know, hallucinations are, are less a, a flaw than they are a feature of generative AI, like their the hallucination mm -hmm. is intended by, you know, the the builders originally to be the product of, of the platforms. They're, they're yeah. many folks with whom I collaborate in the educational world and higher education and universities and in other settings are using hallucinations productively to help learners, yeah. students understand the full diversity of options that arrange from a given scenario and then help their students think about if I were to encounter this situation, what might potentially happen what will likely happen with when a human does this and what else could potentially happen and it, it's a way of kind of encouraging systems thinking it's it might not be what most people do but it, it's very helpful to encourage people to kind of think outside the box it, but however if you're talking to a patient about what actually happened in a clinical study you need to lower the temperature to almost zero and get mm -hmm. to a point where the data that comes out is really consistent with what actually happened in the study get to a grade level that they can understand and, you know, perhaps more importantly, not allow the conversation to kind of, if there is a conversation, you know, if they have a chance to ask questions of their data, not allow it to go kind of off topic. So, you know, it's it's less a question of kind of accuracy, like is the thing that I'm being asked mm -hmm. truth or not, which is important, but also like I don't want it to ask other questions that are not germane to this interaction because typically like those conversations are appropriate for another interaction, maybe with my doctor or my yeah. mother, or my sister, or my caregiver, but not for the model to encounter. Um, or it might be that, you know, the, the the training that's done for the model is really strong on how the trial was designed, the endpoints, the results, the interpretation, and the outcomes, but less strong on other things, like, for example, the pathophysiology of the disease, like why the disease originates in the first place, the incidence and prevalence. So if the patient pushes mm -hmm. on those topics, they're going to get a very superficial response. Like they'll get like, you know, for example, say it's in, I know mental illness very well, say it's in like depression, they'll get an answer like one every five people has depression and they start asking more questions on that. There isn't data in the training set to be able to respond to that query yeah. and they'll find that their answers are left wanting because there just isn't the content to respond to their, their inquiry. So you don't really want to go too far down that path because they're really just there to get a summary of the trial. So you have to really construct the set in such a way that what the conversation is really aligns to their need and to their your expectation. So it's both accurate and helpful, assistive, if you will. You start getting into this new approach to, I believe, user experience uh, interacting with an LLM. Yeah, a lot of the principles are going to stay the same. 
Uh, but there's new considerations to, to the point you're just making. And for the audience, I got to go back to the point you just made, which was super relevant. And I think this is where a lot of people bang their head up against the wall. But you mentioned hallucinations being a feature, not a bug. Uh, that, that's critical for people to wrap their their minds around. That is the benefit of LLMs, that it can do this uh, kind of thoughtful approach to you know thinking through things. And yes, it may not always be quote unquote accurate. Like we're talking about, but there's that's where finding the right use case for the right technology is um, critical in essence. But I just wanted to call back to that because that's that's a great point for the audience. And then you mentioned one other thing too. I want you to yeah, but Matt, if I, if I may, just yeah. on the feature not flaw thing. I mean, I think it, other I've seen other AI experts comment on this as well. I mean, I think it's yeah, it's how you use it and when you use it. So it, it is that yeah. hallucinations, you know, as they're called. It can be helpful when even when what they say doesn't come to pass, because mm -hmm. essentially Gen AI is a prediction machine. And, you know, sometimes the predictions will come true and we call that accurate. Sometimes it doesn't come true. We call it false. But it doesn't mean that what it said is wrong. It's just it's a prediction. Yeah. That, you know, wasn't realized. But it's kind of like if you're planning for war, right, if you're going to war, there's a time for planning and there's a time for doing. Like when you're planning mm -hmm. to go to battle, planning and strategy is paramount. But when you're actually the troops are on the field, it's no longer a great time to be planning how to mount the you know the infantry because they're already marching down the field. So that's not yeah. a great time to be like starting to plan. But that was there was a time for that, and that time has passed. But now is the time for implementing. When you're implementing, you've got to turn the temperature down to almost zero so you get implementation high and planning low. But when you're planning, you want mm -hmm. a wide range of ideas. You want to brainstorm. You want to think about all the crazy things that. People tend not to think about it. AI is exceptional for that, probably better yeah. than almost any other kind of out of the box creative systems thinking that that is done. And better yet, AI with humans for strategic planning is 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 really great. There's some great uh, publications out of Harvard Business Review, out of uh, Inside, a couple other organizations that I've been affiliated with in the past that have done augmented intelligence work around strategic planning, AI and a human together doing strategic planning. It's it's really amazing what they're coming up with. No, that's really good context there. And there's another point you mentioned too. You know, you said you said something along the lines, even if you get something technically right, you know, it may have something to back it up. But if it's not adding value for the user, in your case, it may be a patient or whatever uh, user you're solving for, it doesn't help their outcome, then it's also not super beneficial. So you're almost adding this additional layer of um it, you know, vetting or just thinking through, okay, well, yes, it may be accurate, but does it add value to the experience? And I think that's a really critical thing to actually building solutions that A, people want to use and that B, are going to be effective and have some retention around them. Yeah. I mean, you really can't overstate how important that is. And I think if people don't work in generative AI, they don't really understand why that is why that matters. And I think the, early in the Gen AI experience, I have to, I had this slide and said, yeah, it showed Excel on the, on the screen. I put a big yeah. sign around it and I said, Gen AI is not Excel. Like you don't put content in and then pull something out. It's not like that. You, yeah. you might put content in, but when you go to ask a question, every time you get a response, you're going to get a different answer. And it, it's people are like, what do you mean a different answer? It's not like I'm going to get the same response. No, it's going to be a different response, which is fine if you're brainstorming, fine if you're you know, having a conversation with someone about what might be but not so great if you want to tell the patient the same thing every time. So if you tell someone, you know, for example, that, you know, depression is common in one every five people, and that's what you want to say. And then next time you tell them that, you know, one out of, you know, 5% of the, of the 20% will potentially die by suicide. And you don't want to tell them that, but it does say that, you know, one of the, one of the times, then that's a problem for that interaction. Mm -hmm. It might be true, but it's not helpful for what you want to share. So you, you really need to be careful about, how much information divulge in situations that are not intentionally realized and to yeah. limit accurate but unhelpful conversations in those types of, of situations and limitations. So it's, it's not a matter of, yes, it did not hallucinate, but the content that it generated is actually not useful for the platform, for the dialogue, and therefore mm -hmm. it's not realizing the intentions of the designers. There's probably some mechanisms you could architect into a solution that's doing some type of check on that. As well, whether it's actually user feedback being brought into the the solution or some other type of, you know, AI um, 
bot of some sort that, that, that their goal is to vet the value of the, the output. Yeah, I mean, the way that we do it is that, uh, and most organizations have a similar mechanism at this point, the mm-hmm. RAG type models up front limit the hallucination rate really low. So if the yeah. rate is already at three or four percent, it brings it down to less than one percent already. But then, you know, there is a validation of human element within our teams to make sure the content that goes in is only the right mm. content, if you will. So it's very li- unlikely yeah. to get stuff that is sent out that's not helpful. But usually when we deploy platforms like this, either within our environment or external to, a, say, a client, if you will, they'll also have a human in the loop before it goes out Mm. to a patient or before it goes out to a healthcare provider. So if it comes out of the platform and it says X, Y, or Z, X, Y, or A, whatever it is, they'll check it by a pharmacist or a physician or a PhD or whatever it might be and say, yeah, you know, this is really good, but I change X to G or G to Q or whatever it is, and then send it out the door. So it just gets that last check. And I, I really can't see a time when you take the human completely out of the loop and it's fully autonomous because you're always really human touch. Now, I, I, I can't yeah. see a time where that's going to be the case. I, not, not in healthcare and life sciences. No, that's an interesting prediction. And human in the loop, another good term folks should know. And, and you described it right there. You have a human somewhere in the process that's doing some type of vetting, checking somewhere. So, and I guess your point there is specific to the life sciences and healthcare space. Uh, where you're yeah. always going to want that kind of human in the loop. Yeah, I don't know. In the near future. I've, I've only been in health and life sciences my whole career you know, for the last 27 years. Yeah. So I can't really speak <laughs> very well outside that. But I did this white paper last year with uh, Connor Grennan, who's, who leads the AI program at NYU. And he, uh-huh. he does a lot of work in financial services and other regulated industries. So we wrote this white paper about the, the whole other regulated industries like healthcare, life sciences, finance, mining, the airlines, all the regulated industries. And when mm-hmm. we were chatting about writing the white paper, it's similar in other regulated industries because if you're regulated by the U.S. government or other governments, you you tend to want like a throat to choke, right? You want like yeah. a person that is still accountable for the work that's going out to the field to the customers. And even if the platform is exceptional and the work we do is quite robust, you want someone to be able to say, "Hey, Matt, like you know, when when it did this, why did it do it?" You don't want to be able to. You know, go onto the the customer service line and be like, I have a problem with my device. Like, what's going wrong? Mm-hmm. You want to be able to talk to someone. So I think in the regulated industries, you're still going to probably want a human. Yeah, that's a good point. There's that element of liability that still needs to be uh, accounted for. So, so back to the use cases, just to hit a couple others. And I think in when we were chatting, kind of your core groups, you have patients uh, who, are, who are diagnosed with a condition, trying to make sense of it. You have doctors and clinicians. You have the scientific and technical side of it as well. Any other interesting use cases that either are, um, you know, really kind of novel and interesting or or maybe just some standard ones that are really people are finding a lot of value with? Yeah, I mean, one that was like kind of early for us in the the generative space is uh, around uh, synthetic media, generative media, what the kind of consumer world would call deep fakes, Mm -hmm. if you will. Um, you know, it, it, people kind of poo poo this as like something that in the consumer world is like overdone. Um, but in life sciences and in any environment where you have to train or educate people, generative media really cannot be overstated how powerful and how robust it is, both because you can essentially shorten a process that typically takes three, four months, like taking an expert into a studio and a green screen, filming yeah. them, editing them, writing the script, all the rest, and shorten it to three or four weeks. And then also taking their content, which is almost always in English to start, and then translating it to every language in the world using AI, and then yeah, getting it directly into digital on the web instantaneously, the whole process from four months down to four weeks at a fraction of the cost at high quality. Um, we have done that work primarily with Synthesia, who were the first certified professional services partner for Synthesia. Um, and if we work with a number of life sciences firms to help in advance of like a new product launch, to take their content right after it gets regulatory approval, push it into the Synthesia platform, and then spread it out across all their medics globally. So they have access in every language around the world. And then mm-hmm. they can train all their folks like in a couple of days as opposed to a couple of months. And then they have access to content and it's evergreen. It can be updated on the fly. It, when I, I've been doing this work for a quarter of a century, Matt, and it this used to be the most arduous, annoying process ever. Yeah. It, was always, yeah. it was always behind because it would take so long to update it that by the time we got it out to the field, it was obsolete. But now it's like really dynamic and, and real time. And it's it's just really like a, a pleasure doing the work. At, at we get When we do it, everyone loves it when it's done. 
And it, it's like a great testament to what generative is capable of. No, that, that's such a good one too. And I think it's going to be one of those that's just a given in the future. But I remember also similar to you, it's like you're having to account for different languages in you know web content and all these different things. And it is a pain in the ass process trying to to do all that. It, but it's just going to be a given today. It's going to be one of those where we're sitting here saying, back in my day, we used to have to <laughs> spend weeks and weeks translating all this stuff. And yeah, now it's super easy. I mean, there. I'm sure there's still a role for that in places where you know there's a lot of consideration, and you you have to really kind of uh, you know dot all your eyes and cross all your t's and all the rest. But you know, it, the first one of the first projects we did was for a, a big uh, biopharmaceutical company in Eastern Europe. And it, there were regions of the world that would not have had access to this content if we didn't yeah. do it through this mechanism. And I don't know what they would have done. How, how would they have gotten drug information to these patients if we hadn't done mm -hmm. through this mechanism? So it's not even just a matter of, you know, it's cheaper, it's faster. That's true. But it's access as well. It's getting medicines to people in need, you know, that otherwise couldn't have had it without this technology. Well, and the beauty, too, with, I think, generative AI in this context is it, it's not just a very exact straight translation it can take into different things like dialect the way things are said and those other factors to make it feel more uh more human more native in a sense yeah. as yeah. well uh so on the pace of change we were talking a bit about this it's almost a bit of a double-edged sword you can use it it's accelerating things like crazy but it's just crazy difficult to keep up how, how are you actually keeping pace or what's your approach to keeping pace with it seems like every day a new product solution idea innovative things coming out what's what's your approach there and if, yeah, if just trying to tread water as best you can that's probably an acceptable answer as well no i mean i i don't know how people say stay, stay up to date i ask people that all the time when i meet them like what do they do to stay up to date and i just to kind of you know keep myself you know accountable and doing the right thing i, I can tell you what i do i mean i I've kind of whittled down my newsletter list down to like the top three newsletters that I absolutely mm. love. And I read them every day religiously. Um, yeah. you know, I have like a group of top AI experts that I'm, you know, kind of in a peer group with, and I check in with them regularly, you know, meet them for the coffee or lunch here in the city or in Boston or, you know, in, in Europe on a semi-regular basis to make sure that I'm not missing anything. And I'm often missing things. So they keep me accountable as well. As well. I'm on the OpenAI Executive Forum, uh, so I participate in all of OpenAI's events directly. Um, I attend Google's events. I'm on Gardner's AI Executive Forum as well, their peer forum. Um, so I participate in those activities and just try to listen and learn about what's going on out there in the external environment. And, you know, it, it is so fast. I mean, I, I used to say last year that like a week in generative is like a quarter in the real world. But now yeah. I'm starting to think like a day in generative is like a quarter in the real world because things are just so fast that it's ridiculous. But uh, I, I'm I'm so excited about the future. I think there's so much possibility, like just around the corner. I mean, I think we're of like a similar age. And like when I was a kid, I used to you know read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, and I, mm -hmm. I dream about like the, the future. And then you know the, for most of the last like 30 years, there I kept waiting for my flying cars and all the rest. But uh, I feel like our future is is here, and we're 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 just like at the at the precipice. And there's so much opportunity to help people to improve health and uh, help patients that are suffering with many challenges, including in my case, the passion for, for mental health, that, uh, you know, there's just only upside to follow. Yeah. And that's so well said, and you're in a special spot to actually make some impactful, meaningful solutions as well. But just so the, our audience isn't like on a cliffhanger here, who, who are, you mentioned a couple of newsletters you were, you follow religiously. If you can rattle those off the top of your head. You know, I, I don't know the people. titles. I don't know the titles yeah. of my head because I get so much content on a daily basis that I, I, I just I look at when they come into my news box, but I don't look at the the names. But I can send them to you post call, and and you can share them out with your audience. Yeah, do that. We'll put them in the in the show notes for folks. Just sure, I know weeding through the, the good versus the not so good is tough sometimes. Yeah, I'm happy uh, to do that. No problem. I just I have a problem remembering like kind of how things got into my box, what I'm looking at. Um, yeah. But I know it's there, and I'm, when it's there, I know I was meant to read it. I read it, and I, I digest it, and take notes, and et cetera, et cetera. Nice, nice. Uh, two, two more questions for you. We'll wrap yeah. it up. But what, what gets you the most excited about where AI is going? And that could be in general, or that could be in the healthcare and life sciences space. You know, I think the 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 thing that I'm most excited about is 
really the rate and pace of adoption. And I, the way that I that can really kind of tell that mm-hmm. is two things. One, you know, I watch the Olympics. I don't know if you watch the Olympics the last couple of days, but mm-hmm. every second or third ad in the Olympics was an AI ad. You know, there's a Gemini yeah. ad, there was an open AI ad, there was a meta ad, all AI ads. I can tell you from watching the Olympics, growing up as a kid till now, nothing of interest in the Olympics ads up until this year had any relevance to what I do for a living or what I care about, except the Olympics. Almost (laughs) every ad was an artificial intelligence ad. And there are things that people, real people, not data scientists directly Mm -hmm. use and will be using every day. And a lot of these, a lot of adoption is already happening. We're probably at like true adoption of between like 15 and 20% globally of AI right now by next year to be twice or three times that. So that's extremely exciting. And the other way I know is that when I was at the pool this weekend in my neighborhood, random people that I, you know, that I know from the community that have regular jobs, you know, that one mm. runs a tattoo parlor, one is running a, you know, owns a 16 handles frozen yogurt, when someone is a teacher, you know, they're asking about AI and they're talking about AI, like it's something that could help them in their actual lives. Again, this is not like a common thing for me. Like people would, when I talked about AI the last 15 years, no one wanted to talk about it. Yeah, and then, last year, everyone was running from it. Now people are running towards it, and it's it's a great opportunity to really help improve people, improve people's lives, and I'm really excited about the future. Where do you think we are on the hype cycle of of AI? If we had to like draw a line, is it is it cresting to the top? Is it already reached the top and kind of coming more down to reality? Which or do we have some room to go there? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going to go with uh, I don't know if you know the uh, the business writer uh, Rashad Tabakawala, um, but I'm going to go with his um, his view on this and he his statement is that um ai is not overhyped it's actually underhyped and i mm-hmm. i would agree with him it is, it is it's not my statement it's his i could send you a, a blog post he had on this topic that's actually the title of the, of the blog post ai is underhyped i i yeah. it's when if if people say that it's overhyped it's primarily because they have not used it often enough to get that that degree of frustration that i said earlier and they haven't seen how magical it is to actually fix a real problem in their life or they haven't been pissed off and frustrated enough to realize that they actually need to partner with someone to fix a real problem in their enterprise or in mm-hmm. their life. But when people do those things, they get frustrated or they fix something, they realize that it really is magical. It really is the next electricity. And that day is coming and it's here or one of those things or it's both those things. I don't know. I'm I, yeah. I'm, I'm tired. It's a lot. But it, it, it's, it, it is not overhyped at all. It is extremely underhyped. And I think we'll all look back on 2022, you know, November 2022 as a, as a seminal point in human mm-hmm. society. Yeah. And I, I tend to agree with you there. And I almost, I like equating it back to like the dot com bubble. Yes, there was hype. Yes, there was a bubble. And then there were all the naysayers. But in reality, the hype and the perspective of what the internet could become was actually underhyped of what it actually did ultimately become. So I saw somebody talking about this today, you know, both things could actually be true. We're in kind of a hype cycle and yes, it could change literally everything we do, how we operate um, as well. So yeah, yeah, it's good, good perspective there. But yeah, Matt, I think that's a good, good stopping point there. Where can folks uh, find you, whether it's, uh, you know, following for some of your, your thoughts and thought leadership though, or, uh, or, in in Inizio Medical as well. Yeah, LinkedIn is the best way to get me. All my stuff's on LinkedIn. The Inizio website's on LinkedIn. All the content that I that's public is on LinkedIn. Every podcast like this one or LinkedIn Live that I've ever done is on LinkedIn. Every public facing webinar or presentation is on LinkedIn. All my peer reviewed articles are on LinkedIn. And I'd love to connect and continue the conversation with anyone on LinkedIn. Awesome. Yeah, and give Matt a follow. He's got a lot of good content out there. Thanks for joining today, Matt. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it again everyone's time. Thanks for listening to the Talking AI Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, give us a follow or subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to leave us a review. We love those. For more info on Talking AI, visit TalkingAIPodcast.com. As Gen AI reshapes industries, understanding and leveraging its capabilities is no longer an option, it's a necessity. And that's exactly why at Hatchworks, we developed our Gen AI Innovation Workshop. In this workshop, we immerse you into a full day of learning, hands-on ideation, and building. We hit foundational concepts and show you how they relate to your domain. Then we develop actual use cases for your business and your industry. And we even build a custom GPT based on the use cases we define. 
Check out the link in the show notes or visit hatchworks.com to get started today.